Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this Friday afternoon. Uh, we are here for a very special event. Uh, it is in recognition of NF2 Awareness Day, um, which uh, we celebrate every year. Uh, today we'll be talking about both NF2 and schwannomatosis uh, with an esteemed panel. Um, before we get started, by the way, I'm Simon Buchel. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of the Children's Tumor Foundation. We just wanna share some housekeeping notes uh, one, this webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be available for replay uh, next week. Um, it is also being captioned. Uh, if you need to access the captioning, there is a little CC button at the bottom of the screen uh, and you should just click that and you can adjust your, the size of the captioning. Um, if you are, everyone is muted uh, except for our panel. If you are called on later, if there is time to take in-person questions, we just ask that you mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh, after the webinar is over, all our resources, including on NF2 and schwannomatosis, are available at ctf.org. Um, and uh, we're going to try to take some questions towards the end. We're going to let the panel uh, do its work first. Uh, in order to do that, uh, just submit your questions through the chat function. You can do that throughout the session, and we'll be looking at them. Uh, please note that we cannot answer personal medical uh, questions on this webinar. We, we are going to stay focused on, on the topic at hand. Uh, which Annette will introduce in a moment. Um, so please just keep your questions to those and we'll do our best to answer all of them. If we can't, you can always reach out to us directly. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Annette Bakker, the president of the Children's Tumor Foundation. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, first of all, a very happy NF2 Awareness Day and wear green and blue for NF2 on May 22. So this is the best I can do right wise. Um, today we uh, are going to announce a new educational comic book, which is called Understanding NF. And the comic book is based on the story of Billy Nguyen. And Billy is an NF2 patient who had to face many challenges and choices to be made, as well as his parents, about whether to choose between treatment or surgery. Now Billy is going to graduate next week from medical school from the University of California, San Diego. And we thought that it would be an awesome opportunity to have Billy introduce this topic of the day. Um, so Billy, um, it's all yours. The floor, floor is all yours. And also thank you so much for joining the CTF Junior Board. Thank you so much, Annette. So just as uh, Annette mentioned, I'm a current medical student at UCLA. I'm graduating next week. I'm going to residency at UCSF. Um, and so the comic was an endeavor uh, to showcase the story of like an NF2 patient myself in a way that was very relatable uh, and very identifiable to not only the younger audience, but also for those currently uh, going through NF2 treatment um, in their 20s, 30s, and so on. And so I think it paints a very strong picture and it, it hopefully will resonate with a lot of NF2 patients. Um, so my journey started uh, when I was six, I was diagnosed uh, with NF2. I required surgery in 2009 um, as a first year in uh, high school. And then the decision afterwards with tumor progression, with having other tumors grow and starting therapy uh, was another endeavor. And so just to touch base on the idea of surgery versus treatment, um, I think for me, it was very like tumor dependent. Um, and at the time when we were considering surgery, it's such a scary thing because I think patients don't really know what that entails and what it means. And as a first generation immigrant, I think it was compounded by the fact um, of this language barrier. So having to make the decision and translating for my parents about, you know, do we do like through intranasal? Do we do it on the side? Um, what approach do we use? How do we do it? When is the best time to do it? And having these really difficult conversations in, in a way that not only made sense to me as a 14 year old, but also for my parents who English was not quite their first language. And so I think navigating that space was very difficult. Um, and then years later, considering therapy, um, what type of therapy to, to try? Do we start a clinical trial? Do we start um, a Vastin? Having to kind of relive those memories again, I think was very challenging for me. And so the comic is a way 
that kind of distills this idea down in a very digestible format. Um, and I hope resonates with a lot of other NF2 patients um, and schwannomatosis patients. I'm gonna I'm gonna put up the comic on screen for a second just so that everyone gets a sense, and you should um, be able to then go view it yourself. But uh, so you, as you can see, it's very accessible, uh, uh, you know, for kids of all ages. But it's not really obviously just for, uh, there's a misperception that comics are for kids, but this is purposely done this way because it's um, very easy to follow, very easy to understand. It's very passionate. I mean, by the time it's an eight page comic book put together um, by a wonderful team. Our communications director, Vanessa Younger, wrote it and worked with, um, with uh, Bottled Lightning and a bunch of art artists in the comics industry. Uh, we actually got picked up in Hollywood Reporter today. We just found this out a few minutes ago. Um, so we, we anticipate uh, that this will uh, certainly get some attention. We also have comics for NF1 and uh, NF Research. So if you visit our website, you'll see those. But to see today's, ctf.org slash Billy. Uh, you know, read more about Billy and, and you can access the comic. So thank you, Billy, for, for doing this and congratulations on medical school. And I'm going to turn it back to Annette. Okay, thank you so much, Billy. And um, I think a lot of you will recognize these members on this very esteemed panel that we have today. So we will be discussing the journey of the NF2 patient, and that is mainly focused on tumor manifestations. The second is the journey of a schwannomatosis patient that will mainly focus on pain. The third topic that the panel thought was really important was also to shortly discuss what the impact and the effect is of COVID and what the advice could be from this panel. And then to close, we, they also would like to hand, to hand out some generally um, uh, asked questions, kind of the FAQ if you want, to give you some idea of both effect on man managing the pandemic as well as generally. So we have on the panel to discuss NF2, um, Dr. Leia uh, Nympho. She's Associate Professor and Vice Chair of the Academic Affairs of the Department of Neurology at UCLA. Professor Michelle Calamarides, who is a Professor of Neurosurgery at L'Hôpital de la Salpetriere in Paris. Uh, and for schwannomatosis, we have another in very important duo, uh, Professor Rosalie Ferner. She is Professor of Neurology at Guy's in St. Thomas Hospital in London. And Professor Alan Belsberg, who is George E. Ewer, Professor of Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So um, with that, I would like to turn it over to maybe if each panelist can introduce themselves just in a minute, what brought you to NF and what keeps you in NF these days. So. Um, shall we start in alphabetical order and maybe start with Alan, Dr. Belsberg? Hey there. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate uh, in this. It's obviously a very, very important thing on this day that we're celebrating uh, a lot of the work that's being done in NF. What brought me to it is the patients. It's one of the most remarkable groups of patients that I've ever encountered. And while I was doing general neurosurgery, a lot of peripheral nerve neurosurgery, dealing with the NF patients, including NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis, uh, has been a remarkable journey. Uh, it's, it's really changed my own personality as I've gotten to know these patients better and, and the adversity that they face, how they face it, it really is inspiring. I'm also very excited about the research that we've been doing around these topics, and there's been funding made available for research through the hard work of organizations like CTF. That also helps us uh, in terms of getting funding. So I think it's a very collaborative group and a very exciting group. Thank you. Thanks. Professor Ferner. You, you have to unmute yourself. I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, my journey to um, neurofibromatosis was serendipity. Uh, my boss in the 1980s was friendly with the lay chair. Uh, they shared a wine merchant, and um, he introduced me to her, and I became hooked on, on looking after patients. And it's very much been a partnership between patients and us, and I think we've been educated as much as the patient. So we now have a very big team. 
Um, I focus on NF1 and schwannomatosis, and my colleague, Dr. Friedi, on NF2. Uh, and we have around 2,000 patients with NF1, uh, 200 with NF2, and about 100 with schwannomatosis. Um, we are learning all the time. So although I've been in the field a long time, what's kept me in is the uh, amazing patients, their journey, and their uh, friendship with us. It's almost like a family. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Calabarides. Yes, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, in fact, I think I, I was interested by NF2 because I met mentors. I think we need to get mentors. And my first mentor was Olivier Serkers, the ANT. I was a resident in neurosurgery and during my first year, it was a department focused on vestibular schwannoma surgery. And so I started to, to have interest in vestibular schwannoma and then on NF2 and I did a PhD under the supervision of Marco Giovannini, he's a leader in NF2 research. It was in the lab of Gilles Thomas, uh, one of the lab who discovered the NF2 gene uh, in 1993. So from the beginning, I was involved, involved in, in NF2 and now I'm running the uh, reference, uh, National Reference Center for NF2 in Paris as a surgeon. So it's my uh, main focus, NF2. Thank you. Professor Nimfu. So I came on to the field of NF also because of Dr. Marco Giovannini. As you know, he is very well known for creating the mouse models, uh, different mouse models for NF2 to beat research in this area. He came to UCLA about six years ago and um, he got me involved with his clinical trials there. And since then, um, you know, I've been became very interested in this field first because of the patients like Billy, who, um, you know, I think on the West Coast, there's really not a good center for patients, especially adult patients to come and uh, have kind of comprehensive care for the NF. And then all the research that we are developing now with more and more research opportunities, more clinical and medical treatments for patients with NF. And um, so at UCLA, I am the director for our NF multidisciplinary clinic and trying to focus on developing and uh, being involved in clinical trials for NF patients here at UCLA. Thank you so much. So um, for the people on the webinar, um, the panelists, so the two duos, so Professor Nimfu Calamari, this will couple, will, uh, will cover NF2. And then for Professor Ferner and Belsberg, we'll cover the schwannomatosis topic. So um, with that, I would like to turn it over to the first duo on NF2. I know you guys have a couple of slides. So maybe Simon, can you share the slides? And then um, I will go uh, a little bit more to the background. And for everybody on the call, we will, of course, encourage you if you have certain questions to it to uh, put them in the chat and we will try to answer as many as possible during this um, webinar so on this first slide um, i just want to remind everyone i know everybody here on uh, this webinar knows about nf2 but we just want to let you know that we will focus mostly on tumor specific surgery and medical treatments for nf2 as you may know nf2 have three main types of tumors. Uh, obviously, the most important are the bilateral vestibular schwannomas that um, are seen in, near the brainstem. Patients can also develop multiple meningiomas, which are tumors that are on the lining of the brain. They can also have spine tumors, especially tumor within the spine, which are the pneumomas. At the same time, they can also develop schwannomas and meningiomas throughout other parts of the brain and spine. Oh, Dr. Kala Maridas will start talking about surgery for these tumors. Uh, next slide. Yes, thank you. So I will give you my uh, opinion on the indication for surgery for vestibular schwannoma, meningioma, and spinal tumors. So I think that uh, in such case of NF2 patient on the left, uh, you can see that there is a, a brain stem compression. And in this case, surgery 
uh, for me is uh, mandatory to remove the uh, brain stem compression. What is a clinical brain stem compression? I would say it's a, a gait disturbance, thyroid disorder, hydrocephalus. So in this case, on the left uh, vestibular schwannoma, I think that surgery is indicated, uh, and but it's not a total removal that should be targeted. I think that the most important is to preserve the facial nerve function. And it's more important than the total resection because now we have scam and knife medical treatment. So in such case, we decide to remove the left schwannoma. And you can see on the, on the middle uh, MRI, uh, some remnant in the auditory canal uh, which we left this uh, small tumor because the fascia nerve wo was uh, very thin and the patient after the surgery uh, has a very good, uh, uh, the normal fascia nerve function and a good uh, recovery. Uh, with such a uh, strategy, we, we were able to improve the uh, fascia nerve function after surgery and you know in NF2, it's, it's critical to have a normal facial nerve function. So uh, you can see on the right that the uh, right vestibular schwannoma is smaller. Uh, and it's because uh, due to the tumor growth, we decide to give bevacizumab to this patient. So you can see it's a combined treatment for such patient with surgery and bevacizumab. So next slide. Uh, the second uh, possibility for surgery is uh, in case of uh, small or medium-sized growing uh, schwannoma. Uh, on the first side, with good hearing. So this is a typical, typical case of a young patient, and you can see on the right, a growing vestibular schwannoma. In this case, it's very difficult to decide surgery because uh, you should avoid facial nerve palsy, you should try to preserve hearing, and it's possible to preserve hearing in such case in 60% of cases with uh, monitoring of the cochlear nerve. But in such case, you can decide to do gamma knife, or uh, you can decide to, to give a treatment. So it's an uh, open discussion with the patient, uh, and we present all the possibility uh, in, the, in our NF2 center, we have the gamma knife surgery and the medical treatment and the patient will decide. In, if the patient is very young, uh, if he has a, not a severe NF2 and we use uh, uh, NF2 genetic testing to predict uh, the disease, maybe we can decide surgery, but I think it's another uh, possibility where surgery can be uh, used to treat uh, vestibular schwannoma. Next slide. So I would say that uh, uh, there is another place for surgery, not only removing the tumor, but in such case, we, we use surgery sometimes to uh, maintain hearing. So for example, when you have a patient uh, with a stable, uh, small or medium-sized schwannoma with hearing worsening, based on audiometry or uh, uh, auditory evocated uh, potential. Sometimes uh, we propose to the patient to do uh, decompression of the uh, internal auditory canal. This technique was uh, described by uh, Brackman at, uh, in Los Angeles. And you can drill the, the bone, uh, you can see on the left, and open the dura, and we observe uh, preservation of hearing. And uh, to, to help for hearing, uh, there, there are cochlear implants and ABI. So um, surgery can give back uh, hearing in case of total deafness with cochlear implant and ABI. Um, next, I want to move to uh, meningioma. Um, and uh, this uh, slide uh, we publish uh, today in the Journal of Neurosurgery, we published uh, our series of uh, meningioma in NF2 patients. I would say that maybe it's, uh, for me, what is the most difficult part is not to remove the meningioma because it's similar to sporadic meningioma. It's to decide uh, which meningioma should be removed, when and how. On the left part, you, you see on the left, three different meningioma. And in few years, you will see that um, the, on the upper part, it will 
stay stable and the two others will grow. So my difficulty when I see a patient is to predict tumor growth. You see the annual growth uh, in a centimeter cube per year. And in fact, when you follow every year a lot of uh, meningioma, finally only 20% of this meningioma will grow uh, very fast. So uh, in, the, in this new paper, we use a scoring system based on the tumor diameter, calcification, edema, T2 signal to predict. And it, wor it works pretty well. So uh, I think that uh, one goal for meningioma in case of multiple small meningioma is to predict which meningioma should be removed. Uh, and when one meningioma is growing with edema, you have to go. Most of the uh, meningioma in NF2 patients are on the convexity. It's, it's rare to have skull-based meningioma. So uh, I think that uh, for me, uh, it's, to, it's to remove, it's to decide to remove the meningioma, which, which is the most difficult part. Uh, next slide. Uh, one, uh, I want to, to, to discuss one point is you need a regular follow-up uh, for meningioma and for NF2. You need to, to, to follow by uh, MRI. And I want to point out the ophthalmological follow-up because uh, in NF2 patients with multiple meningioma, sometimes you can have uh, intracranial hypertension with uh, uh, papillary edema. And uh, he, some patients could have blindness because of hypertension. So you have to, to follow the patient and it's not only the tumor growth, but it's the clinical condition of the patient or the uh, ophthalmologic uh, fundus that can decide to remove or to put shunt. So be follow every year regularly, go to the hospital even uh, with the COVID if something uh, is wrong. Finally, uh, next slide. Surgery for spinal tumors and uh, Alan can, uh, can comment. I think that uh, when you uh, perform uh, spinal MRI in NF2 patient, sometimes you, you, are, you will discover a lot of tumors. And uh, uh, so the patient are disappointed by the number of tumors. You see a patient with a bilateral vestibular schwannoma, and then you ask for a spinal MRI and you discover multiple uh, tumors. So I think that uh, for me, you, uh, I decide to remove only the symptomatic spinal cord uh, tumor. It means uh, the tumor that will comp compress the spinal cord uh, with the difficulty to walk or to move the, the hands, so meningioma or schwannoma. And it works very well because when you uh, remove uh, compressing uh, meningioma, the patient will improve very fast. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are some uh, ependymoma. It's much more difficult to remove ependymoma, but I think that we have to keep in mind that sometimes there are growing and large uh, ependymoma, as you can see on the, uh, on the middle. Uh, on T2, and you can see a cyst, and most of the, these tumors are growing uh, because of the cystic part. And when they are symptom or without symptom, I think that we have to decide to remove the uh, solid part of the tumor, because we know that for ependymoma, it's difficult to improve the patient. So if you are waiting too long uh, to avoid, uh, to take risk, you will have a patient that will uh, decrease his performance and it's too late sometimes. So I think that sometimes in patients with some uh, growing ependymoma, we have to decide to remove them. Uh, I'm, I'm done. I think it was a summary of all the surgical options in NF2. So I'll talk a little bit about medical treatment. And first, I'll talk about what the options are. And then I'll talk a little bit about when we would want to consider medical treatments over surgery or radiosurgery. Um, I do want to note that in the US, and I 
pretty sure the rest of the world also, there's really no actual FDA approved medical treatments for NF2. So in the US, we use these medical treatments mostly in what we call off-label use or in experimental clinical trials. Um, they are usually molecular targeted therapies because we know chemotherapy is not effective for NF2, but we do, do use agents that are used in oncology. So oftentimes they are thought of as chemotherapy because they are used for other cancer, but they are actually not chemotherapies. They are molecular targeted therapies that are targeting proteins that are required for cellular functions such as growth or metabolism. So on the next slide um, is the probably the most commonly used off-label medical therapy that we use now for patients with NF2, and that is bevacizumab. In the US, the brand name is Avastin. And this drug targets a protein called VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. And it has been shown in several clinical trials now that it's great at improving hearing function. Uh, almost half of the patients will get hearing improvement when they use, go on this drug. Uh, but it's not as good for tumor shrinkage. A small percentage of patients do get tumor shrinkage, but not as good as their hearing improvement. And it is an IV drug. It's usually given every two to three weeks. Um, and it can have some potential long-term side effects. Um, it can cause hypertension, uh, clots in the venous system, kidney problems, bowel perforation, one other problem with it is that it can cause wound healing problems that, so that we cannot use it right around the time of surgery. So we often cannot use it right before surgery. And we definitely have to wait four to six weeks after a surgery before we can give somebody with bevacizumab. And um, I mentioned that pretty much because I think there was a question on the chat that asked about that. Um, there's also some question that it can cause ovarian dysfunction and therefore um, childbearing difficulty for young women. So oftentimes to make a decision on when to use bevacizumab or not is based on timing. Um, we do think that one um, indication for it use is when the tumor, um, the, vest the vestibular schwannoma, is slowly growing are not really growing, but it's causing hearing problems. So when it's very slow growing or really not growing, um, a patient may not want to opt for surgery at that time. The other possibility is they already had a resection of the vestibular schwannoma on one side and so have complete hearing loss on one side of the ear. And uh, we are trying to preserve hearing on the other ear. So if the tumor is slowly growing, but is starting to have hearing loss on the opposite side, that's also maybe a time to consider using a drug like bevacizumab. We do use it off-label for growing meningiomas or pneumomas that cannot be removed by surgery, but it's a bit unclear about how effective it is for those types of tumors. Uh, on this next slide. Other than bevacizumab, uh, we also have many different options that are in clinical trials. And the top table I have there that's um, in pink and purple is actually what you can find on the CTF website. Uh, some of the clinical trials there, like the clinical trial for mTOR targets or VEGF target with bevacizumab are actually have stopped enrollment at that this time. But there are um, always other clinical trial options that are available. One of the two trials that are in development now, there is a trial that is uh, part of the NF consortium that is uh, sponsored by the Department of Defense, is a drug called Crizotinib. And that uh, trial is available for patients who are having growing vestibular schwannoma, and it targets something called ALK. There's also a new innovative platform clinical trial that um, is called Intuit NF2, and that is CTF sponsored. And the point of platform clinical trial is that we're hoping to actually test multiple targeted drugs for NF2 on one clinical trial. 
Right now, uh, the trial will have a drug called progastinib, and it targets both different targets called ALK and EGFR. And these are both targets that have been shown to, um, when blocking these targets, it can lead to tumor shrinkage in, patient, in NF2 type of tumors. And this trial is probably going to be available uh, by the end of the year. And oftentimes, we have to decide but if um, surgery or trial options or bevacizumab. So I kind of mentioned when we would use bevacizumab. I think a lot of time, if a patient has a, a possibility of a bad side effect from bevacizumab, or they have been on it before, or want to delay the use of bevacizumab because the hearing is relatively stable, um, and we don't need to try and preserve hearing, but tumor is grow, slowly growing. Um, tumor is growing in a way that a complete resection is difficult to do. Uh, clinical trial, I think, are very good options. Intuit NF2 trial will also allow treatment for growing tumors um, other than vestibular schwannomas. So if a patient has a growing meningioma, they can also enroll into that trial versus if you see on uh, the clinical op trial option pink table, a lot of the uh, trials are really just focused mostly on vestibular schwannomas. So I, I think that's kind of a very quick summary about medical versus surgery for NF2. So I have a couple of questions, but um... Maybe we can keep all the questions for the end and just walk through the um, move over to the schwannomatosis duo, let's say, and then um, I'll just keep collecting questions. Um, so for the people on the phone, do not despair. Your questions will be answered just towards the end. So Dr. Ferner, Dr. Balsberg, I leave it up to you guys to talk about the journey of the schwannomatosis patients. Uh, I assume Dr. Ferner is gonna start with the non-surgical medical. Not sure if you are on mute, Dr. Ferner, but we can't hear you. Albert, can you check, please? Because we do not hear Dr. Ferner. Looks like Dr. Ferner. Yes, looks like Dr. Ferner um, logged the, off of Zoom. Internet. So maybe Dr. Balsberg, would you mind starting? Because she will be back hopefully later, but there seems to have been some technical glitch. Sure. So uh, we'll kind of go in reverse order. What we'll do is we'll start uh, with a surgeon's approach to schwannomatosis. And again, I'm going to focus on schwannomatosis. And absolutely enforce right from the start that you never want to start with the surgeon. You always want to start with the non-surgeons, with your oncologist, geneticist, neurologist, whatever group you're seeing for management of uh, neurofibromatosis or schwannomatosis. The surgeon should always be the last stop, never the first stop. But having said that, uh, we'll, we'll start with the surgical approach. So I'm going to uh, go on to a screen share. Okay, so we're gonna bounce through this fairly quickly. Um, I'm gonna give you some heads up when there's going to be some uh, operative shots. I have to include some operative shots or I'm not a surgeon, but uh, on the other hand, I realize this is for patients. So you may or may not wanna see what things look like at the time of surgery. Some patients love it, some patients hate it, but I'll give you a heads up on that. Uh, it's COVID time, so I wanted to begin with this for COVID. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have already seen this one, but it is my favorite, so I'm gonna play this. Because of coronavirus, you are going to be quarantined, but you have a choice. Do you A, quarantine with your wife and child, or B, B. 
So I, I hope that came through. Because of uh, schwannomatosis, unfortunately, the worst thing about schwannomatosis is the pain. And for most of the patients, we really see them because of pain, uh, not necessarily tumors that are growing and causing neurological deficit. While that is certainly a common presentation, the most common presentation by far is pain. And so as a surgeon, as a non-surgeon, that's what we have to deal with. And that's really what we have to help our patients with. So when we think about neurofibromas and schwannomas, and I borrowed uh, this from University of Pennsylvania. They have a beautiful publication on this. This kind of shows the difference between a neurofibroma and a schwannoma. The classic neurofibroma we think of as filling a whole peripheral nerve. Here's the nerve, an electric cable, and the whole cross section of the cable is filled with tumor. And that's what it looks like at the time of surgery. And here's a surgeon excising the tumor. That's your typical neurofibroma. The schwannoma, and whether it's schwannomatosis, whether it's NF2 with a peripheral schwannoma, or for that matter, a solitary schwannoma, we think of that tumor as growing more on the surface of the nerve rather than through the complete cross-section. So here the artist has shown the tumor on the surface of the nerve. Now in reality, as this tumor grows, it actually tends to envelop a lot of the nerve. And it's not a very easy thing to necessarily take the tumor and leave the nerve. But nevertheless, we do think of a schwannoma as a more straightforward tumor to remove versus a neurofibroma. And here's an intraoperative view again of a schwannoma. And here it is removed on block. This was a, a spinal one. This is from the Mayo Clinic publication. And it's a very important cartoon. It's a very important diagram. Because this really tells the difference between a patient who has a solitary schwannoma versus a patient with schwannomatosis or neurofibromatosis type 2 who have multiple schwannomas. So when there's a single solitary schwannoma, we can usually, and this is a peripheral nerve, we can usually find a plane of dissection to remove the tumor and leave all of the important neural elements alone. But sometimes in schwannomatosis, it's actually multiple tumors that are all stuck together. And in this case, if the surgeon comes in and tries to remove the tumor, they can easily damage the nerve, especially when they don't understand that it's multiple tumors rather than one solitary tumor. And again, this is what it looks like in cross-section. So it's very important to understand the difference between a solitary schwannoma and a patient who has multiple schwannomas often bunched together. The outcome changes dramatically and the surgery becomes much more complicated and therefore higher risk. So what goes into the decision making? What are we thinking about when we have to decide whether or not surgery is truly indicated? These are our main indications to actually go ahead with surgery. A progressive neurological deficit, the patient's deteriorating, the tumor is destroying or compromising either the spinal cord or peripheral nerve. Tumor growth affecting adjacent structures. Some patients who have multiple schwannomas in the abdomen, for example, start to compromise the bowels or the liver or something else from the sheer mass of the tumor. Growth of the tumor on serial imaging. This is a little more controversial. As many of you, I'm sure, are doing, we follow patients over time with MRIs. What happens if we seek serial growth on repeated MRIs? Is that an indication for surgery? Debatable. Pain, the most common reason we take out a tumor in schwannomatosis. Tissue diagnosis. Sometimes we need to know what the tumor is. We're not sure by radiology and we want a piece of the tumor. Finally, malignant tumor with negative margin. Fortunately, malignant tumor and the malignant degeneration of a schwannoma is actually very rare. It does occur in schwannomatosis. Originally, we thought it never occurred, but it occurs very rarely. So we're very fortunate with that. Imaging is very, very important. And imaging really has, has dramatically improved. Uh, really the work at, at MGH uh, pioneered a lot of this. We've come on board with it as of many centers around the world. Whole body MRI has become the gold standard. So we follow most of our patients with neurofibromatosis, schwannomatosis and so on with whole body MRI. And then we put that together with the other studies. And this is what that looks like. This is a PET scan. And so many of you may have had a PET scan. That's the PET scan, it's a metabolic scan. And here's the CAT scan that goes along with the PET scan. On this side would be a whole body MRI examination. 
and we can see different tumors. We combine a PET scan and a CAT scan to produce a fused scan down here, for example. Hot tumor that we see on the PET combined with the CAT scan to show where it is. And then over here, we can combine all of the images on, for example, an MRI exam, and we can do various special studies to determine what a tumor likely is, how aggressive that tumor is, and whether or not we need to go after it. Some of the more advanced imaging, this is the brachial plexus area up here on the shoulder. Here's a tumor, and with advanced imaging, we can start to see some of the nerve fibers crossing the tumor, and it gives the surgeon a pathway to get into that tumor if they need to remove it. What happens when we have to do a biopsy? Now, this is neurofibroma that I'm showing you, as opposed to a schwannoma, but it gives you an idea of why a biopsy can be a problem. In this histology slide, so this is a piece of a tumor that's been removed from a patient actually with a neurofibromatosis one. That's a normal looking area of nerve. This has increased blue or increased cells, lots more cells, and over here, this is actually a cancer. Now this whole slide is microscopic, and you can imagine if a big needle came in and took a piece here, pathologists would say, oh, normal nerve. And if they took a piece here, they'd say, well, it's a little abnormal. If they took a piece here, they'd say, oh, cancer. But it would be very easy to get confused. So sometimes biopsies can be very difficult, very challenging. So let's look at a few cases and try to understand how this all plays out. 37-year-old male with schwannomatosis, pain radiating down the arm into the fourth and fifth digit and dropping things. So pain coming down here and going into my fourth and fifth little finger and so on. What do we have to do in a patient like this? We have to find the tumors and we have to decide which tumors account for the problem. Now here in this patient, they found two tumors in the arm. One was up in the brachial plexus over here and one was in the forearm. And the question is, well, which of the two tumors is causing the problem? And that requires the doctors to really carefully work that out. And you may jump too quickly and go to the wrong tumor. So we have to do that very slowly and carefully. This is what it looks like. For those of you who don't want to see surgery, turn your head. But this is the armpit for the axilla, the arm going out, the hand would be down here. We've opened up and there's the tumor. Now that tumor is intimately involved and all of these little threads are going around nerves. And each of those nerves has to be stripped off. These are all the nerves that are intimate with the tumor. We have to remove the tumor, but leave all of these little bits of nerve. Otherwise the patient has a deficit. And here it is lifting the tumor up and leaving all the nerves intact. That's what we want to see in the end. The tumor come out in one piece and all the nerves left alone. Now it can get a little more complicated depending on who's doing the surgery. 30 year old female with schwannomatosis who presents with a lot of pain intercostal, that means in the chest. And on this MRI, this is the chest, we see lungs over here and here's a tumor. The tumor is inside the chest up against the spine. Depending on which surgeon that patient sees, they may get a very different operation. That patient did go for a number of opinions. One person, the chest surgeon said, you need to open the chest and take the tumor out that way, called a thoracotomy. They went to see a spine surgeon who said, no, you come from the back of the spine. We're gonna open up the spine and come from the back and take the tumor that way. Many different approaches, which is the right one. Often there's no for sure right or wrong, but this is how we did this tumor. You're looking inside the chest now with a thoracoscopic. So this is done with just a little scope through a little hole in the chest and there's the tumor on the inside. The lung has been deflated. And then we're gonna take out that tumor using micro instruments on the inside of the chest, put it in a bag, Bob's your uncle, out goes the tumor, left with a little scar here. That patient went home the same day from the hospital. Okay, a much more complicated schwannomatosis patient, nine year old, and his whole abdomen is filled with tumor, as is the spine. So this is schwannomatosis at its worst for us, and this is a major problem dealing with something like this. This requires a multidisciplinary group, multiple different surgeons with different kinds of specialties. We had to straighten out the spine, put in instrumentation, debulk the tumor, both from the front and the back, much more complicated. What happens when we're still left with pain? We've removed the tumor, but we still have pain. Neuromodulation is a more modern approach. This includes spinal cord stimulators, peripheral nerve stimulators, 
It's a way of delivering electricity in a very minimalist way to try to modulate the pain and decrease the pain that way. And it's very effective, used by usually the pain groups when other medications fail, when surgery fails, and so on. Putting it all together, what's the take home message for our patients? Surgery is always based on risk versus benefit. And one has to understand what the risks are. The patient has to understand, be well informed, and then make a decision with their surgeon. Now, many of the risks change depending on where the tumor is in the body, structures around it, the spinal cord around it. When you have multiple tumors that you do in schwannomatosis, sometimes we get the right tumor, sometimes we may miss the tumor that's causing the pain and take the wrong one, that is a risk. Surgeon experience is critical. As I showed you before, there are some surgeons who've taken out single schwannomas, but have never taken out a schwannoma and schwannomatosis, which is a different type of problem. Pain's the most common indication for surgery, without question, for schwannomatosis. Multidisciplinary teams bring many tools in the tool belt. The more tools you have, the more we can offer the patient, the more different types of treatments. If you go to a single physician, they may only have a single treatment to offer you. When you go to a clinic that specializes in neurofibromatosis, you usually bring in many different disciplines. Each one may have something to offer. Finally, buzzwords. And this is again, the take home message. This always makes me nervous when I hear about surgeons who advertise certain things. Microsurgery. Any surgeon today uses microsurgery. Somebody who has to advertise that they use microsurgery, I'm always worried about. Laser surgery. The laser is just a tool in our tool belt. And when, again, I see advertisements or a patient comes to me and says, oh, so-and-so uses laser surgery. Isn't that the best? I always get worried about that. That's a buzzword. Enucleation is something we're seeing in a lot of papers now being published by non-neurofibromatosis or schwannomatosis surgeons. Like it's been rediscovered. When you remove a schwannoma, you do by definition enucleate it. You remove the tumor from its capsule. That's how you remove it. That's how we've been doing it for 60 to 100 years. But there's people who are advertising this modern technique. It doesn't make sense. Cyber knife, very specific usage. By the way, the cyber knife is not a knife, it's radiation. When someone advertises that they are the very best surgeon, you stay away from that surgeon. Nobody ever calls themselves the very best surgeon who are good surgeons. They advertise they invented the technique. Stay away from somebody who always claims that. And finally, when the surgeon says, and I've run into this many times, you don't need a second opinion. I'm telling you what you need. Never trust a surgeon who's afraid that you're gonna get a second opinion. We always welcome second opinions. Anyone who's afraid of getting a second opinion as a surgeon is usually somebody who lacks confidence in what they're doing and probably shouldn't be doing it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to have spoken with you. This is our gang of Johns Hopkins who are doing pain research. And many of the people you see in this picture are involved in, in pain as it relates to schwannomatosis. And we really do hope to have a lot of good things for you in the not too distant future. Thank you, Dr. Berkeley. Um, Dr. Ferner, I saw you came back on the webinar. Thank you so much. Um, just in general, maybe we may be a little running late, so I hope people appreciate this webinar enough to just stay on for a few minutes more. But um, Dr. Ferner. Yes, I, I apologize. Um, everybody turns on their television set to see what the government have got to say about coronavirus at this time and the whole internet crashed. So um, I hope you can hear me and I hope the Prime Minister is not so exciting that it happens again. So um, what I uh, wanted to do is to focus on the clinician's uh, view of management of pain in schwannomatosis. And um, I uh, really wanted to say that in our clinic, we have multiple people. So there is a, a neurologist, a pain physician who's an anesthetist, uh, a neurosurgeon and a peripheral surgeon, uh, and importantly, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, as well as a specialist nurse. So we're, we're very focused on the holistic uh, treatment, but also on a partnership with our patient, because 
um, some of these decisions are, are actually tailored to the individual um, and what the individual needs. So could I have the next slide, please? So uh, the majority of us will have experienced uh, either acute or chronic pain at some time in our lives, unless we're one of the few people with these rare genetic disorders that uh, mean that they're insensitive to pain. Um, and it has been defined as a, an unpleasant uh, sensory or emotional response to either um, actual or potential tissue damage or, or described in terms of such damage. But what do definitions mean in such a, a complex setup? So um, really it is about what that means to an individual and what the impairment of their quality of life and functioning is in the context of pain. And clearly you can have acute or chronic pain um, it can arise not just from nerves. Uh, Alan has um, eloquently shown you uh, the position of the schwannoma on the nerve, but it may arise from muscles, joints, tendons, bone and skin. And, and one of our duties is to see whether the, the pain actually is related to schwannomatosis. You can uh, have an injury to your leg that is totally unrelated. So um, please can I have the next slide? So what we do in conjunction with the, the person there is to decide whether the pain is diffuse or focal, whether it may be chronically aching or sharp, but the really the main complaints are really neuropathic. So you may recognize the burning, the electric shock, pins and needles tingling, a painful sort of cold as if you've been in the freezer, numbness or indeed itching and we know from very recent research that there's an overlap between the pain and itching pathways. Now you see a picture of one of our patients with a very large schwannoma which was intensely painful but you will recognize that the size of the schwannoma does not always relate to this the actual intensity of pain. Um, so could I have the next slide please? Um, Alan has really uh, showed that many things are possible with a brilliant surgeon, but uh, to a clinician, the sight of the pain uh, may influence whether we uh, invite a surgeon along. Um, as he's shown, you can have multiple tumours in different sites, and it can be quite difficult to determine which tumour is the tumour that you need to go for as a surgeon. If you've got multiple tumours along a sciatic nerve, and you have sciatic nerve pain, so that pain in the vatic going down to the leg, which one of those, or all of those, are, are implicated? Um, and as he's shown you, these huge ones in the pelvis can be very problematic. You've got to balance benefit against risk. So um, please could I have the next slide? Um, when we're deciding about treatment, frequency is obviously important because some people have very frequent pain, almost daily pain, but others may have pain, it may be very intense, but it only occurs say uh, once a month. Would that influence you to have surgery? Well, it's made very much up to the individual. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, most physicians um, across the board in Europe and the US um, assess pain intensity. So, how intense is it at this moment? How is it at its best? And how is it at its worst? And, and that's done by a very simple scale, which I'll just show you at the end. Um, the numerical rating scale. So noughts, no pain, tens the worst pain. And in children, you can do it by faces grimacing or smiling. Uh, and then obviously you want to, it's what the impact of pain is on quality of life, on, on daily functioning, on your job, on your studying, on your socializing. And those are the things that are important to individuals. So next slide, please. Um, so this is the, the Merca study, and you can see that in their series of patients, 68% um, of them had pain, 
and it could be local or diffuse or in lots of positions. It had an impact on work in a few. And um, Alan will be pleased to know that in 80% it was an indication for surgery. It's kept him in business. Um, so uh, the next slide, please. So in Guy's Hospital, um, this was done a few years ago, we, um, we, we just questioned patients in the clinic and um, as has been implicated, the vast majority of them had as their major complaint that of pain. A small group um, completed a, a neuropathy pain questionnaire. Next slide, please. And um, the commonest problem was electric shocks. Um, and obviously other neuropathic symptoms were quite a problem. And, and about half of them, or more than half of them, had really in major intensity of pain. Anything over five is, is really quite significant, and that's on this uh, numeric rating scale. Uh, next, please. So what do we do about treatment? Well, what I haven't put up here is that some people don't want treatment. They just carry on, they do Pilates, they do yoga. Uh, they are able to manage their pain. But we start with simple painkillers and that's things like paracetamol, which I think you call Tylenol. Uh, our experience is in this sort of pain, it's not very effective. And then you have, um, the anti-inflammatory uh, tablets, which are like um, indomethacin, um, ibuprofen. And um, in some people, uh, they find it effective and they are what we call uh, COX uh, inhibitors. And um, they reduce prostaglandins, which are one of the mediators of pain. They've been in the news because um, the French had uh, about four patients who didn't have any other problems, but unfortunately got uh, COVID-19 and uh, had very severe disease. And so across um, all of Europe, and I guess in the US, there was uh, a warning going out, don't use uh, indomethacin ibuprofen like drugs. Um, but when people actually looked at all the evidence, there was very little evidence um, across the board that it did make things worse. So it is now accepted you can use it again. Um, the amitriptyline and duloxetine really work to increase um, serotonin and norepinephrine, uh, which, which um, relieve pain. Um, Duloxetine is also used um, as to improve mood and amitriptyline used to be used in that way. Uh, and they, they have been useful for neuropathic pain. And then you have the gabapentinoids that a lot of people are on, which were originally started life for seizures. Um, one of the problems is that it's been recognized that these are um, drugs that are um, very prone to being um, misused. And in the UK, these are now both controlled medications. And that's really put us clinicians off using them. It's much more difficult to prescribe. Um, Scott Plotkin has um, started a um, double blind placebo controlled trial on tenezumab, which is a monoclonal antibody that acts against a uh, nerve growth factor. And um, nerve growth factor binds with uh, this TRK, which um, is on um, the sensory nerve endings and mediates uh, pain to the, the peripheral and central nervous system. So it has been used in arthritis and there's some indication it might be useful in neuropathic pain. Uh, they're not recruiting, um, but we look forward to hearing some of the results of this uh, exciting new study. Uh, next slide, please. So, of course, you can use opioid drugs, which um, act centrally and, and inhibit 
pathways, um, da descending pathways. One of the problems, obviously, is dependence, so they should be used with great caution. If you've got a very superficial uh, schwannoma, uh, you may respond to a local anaesthetic, lidocaine patches, and we found that very useful in clinic. Um, and capsaicin cream has been used. I must say that our um, patients have not really had benefit, but other people may have had different experiences. And, and um, Alan has mentioned uh, spinal cord stimulators. You can block uh, nerve roots with anaesthetic to improve pain. Um, and, and obviously we should not underestimate the role of psychological treatments. Uh, it may be associated with depression if you have severe pain. So antidepressants, anti-anxiolytics -anx are, are uh, useful. And then various forms of, of actual support, cognitive behavioral therapy. So trying to turn around negative thoughts or act where you, um, you accept what your thoughts are but you focus on mindfulness and, and positive experiences. And people who don't like drugs um, go to our psychologists frequently, and this has actually been very helpful. So um, next slide, please. Um, just to remind you that um, the REN's community have uh, recommended some pain scales. The, Promise uh, and pain interference really look at function on a day-to-day -day activity basis, socialising behaviour in children, um, and we've mentioned the numeric rating scale. So there are sort of objective measures. Uh, and, and next slide, please. Um, and, and finally, just a word on COVID-19. Um, we've um, the reason that I left you briefly was that the internet becomes incredibly busy at this time. So we've had to um, think of new ways of, of working. Um, we've had to get used to having new hairdressers. We have to get used to wearing rather unfortunate clothing. And we're not surgeons, Alan. Um, we see our patients as necessary with all due precaution, but many of them we see remotely, so by phone or video. Um, the feedback to us is very variable and it doesn't really replace that face-to-face -face consultation. Um, there are positives. Um, a rather bored uh, neurologist used some candy to make the coronavirus. Um, when I travel in the morning, you can see the underground is empty at rush hour. And we're just by Tower Bridge, and normally Tower Bridge is packed out with people. And we can now visit it in almost uh, total isolation. Uh, but these are no doubt challenging times for people with chronic disorders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferner. Um, maybe what I would like to do is quickly jump to the questions first, and then maybe if we have a few more minutes, touch on the COVID situation. But there's a couple of questions that I think are really important. Um, the first question um, is whether you have seen, what is the importance of a center of excellence? Have you seen better outcomes in centers of excellence? Um, I don't know who wants to take that question, but I think it is important to quickly address it. Um, I think I know the answer, but I just want to... It's, so it's, it's difficult to look at data, hardcore data for that, uh, because non-centers of excellence tend not to publish their data. So to actually do a study on it is difficult. From a patient's point of view, and I'm a patient for, not for neurofibromatosis, but from my own issues and my family issues and so on. A center of excellence, what they bring to the table are the different types of approaches because they have different disciplines, doctors of different backgrounds coming to see the patient and providing their background. So almost by definition, the outcomes are going to be better because if you have more things to offer, more different, different types of treatments, usually you're gonna get the right treatment at that type of center. So we really do believe in that and push it hard for syndromes like this. Not for everything, 
I mean, there are certain types of medical problems that I think it's better to go to your family physician or your local doctor down the street or, or in the community who can provide a very personalized approach and a, and a good follow-up. But for neurofibromatosis, one and two, for schwannomatosis, our belief is that should be a multi-specialty, multidisciplinary specialty center. Okay, thank you. Then there was a, uh, were a couple of questions about treatment options for NF2. So there was a question about, um, this is maybe for you, Leah, the, what the expectations are of the outcome of brigatinib. Do you expect brigatinib, if that would compare to Avastin, do you expect brigatinib to have effect, an effect on also on hearing and vestibular schwannomas? Um, is there some expectation there. The other question was around that most of the drugs that are used now for NF2 are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. This was clearly someone who's in the field and because that person also said that loss of Merlin is also affecting the nucleus and microtubules. And if there are any trials addressing that. Um, and then the last question, so again, in, in the still uh, treatment arena is that, okay, Avastin today um, is used why is that not an official drug? Why is that still used as an off-label? Are we thinking of making that a little bit more an on-label drug? And is there a second line after Avastin? So I'm bombarding you with these three questions, right. but I'm trying to group them a little bit to make it possible to answer the questions um, by group, let's say, so by drug treatment. Right. So um, I, I think I'll uh, address a little bit about um, the regadnib. Um, it's still, it's actually the trial has not started yet. So most of our experience in regadnib so far has only been in uh, kind of basic science and also mouse model work. So it's hard to know yet whether it will be helpful for hearing or not. Our experience with the tyrosine kinases have been that unlike bevacizumab, they don't seem to affect hearing as much as uh, more stopping tumor growth or shrinkage of tumor. So it's a little different from bevacizumab where bevacizumab seems to have more of an effect on function and hearing. Um, you know, and, and I think kind of um, on that note, I'll explain a little bit about the tyrosine kinases and kind of why bevacizumab is so off-label. I mean, at least for the US and really in any country of the world in order to get a drug indication for certain disease, you have to go through uh, something called registration trial, work with the FDA, and really uh, have proof that that drug works before the FDA would um, approve that drug for that indication. And with a disease like NF2, sometimes it, you know, it's very rare. Um, it's difficult to put a lot of patients on the trial. And now that it is used so universally on an off-label setting, it would be hard to really create another clinical trial that is a registration trial in order to get the FDA to approve it. I think there's enough clinical data out there that oftentimes insurance companies will cover bevacizumab for patients with growing uh, vestibular schwannomas with NF2. And so it's it's relatively easy to get off label. So um, that's why it does not have an FDA indication. At the same time, if we try and put bevacizumab through our trial and get FDA indication, it can also limit us on trying to find other treatment options. Because like I mentioned, bevacizumab doesn't work for all the patients and uh, it doesn't necessarily stop tumor growth or shrink tumor for a lot of patients. So we're still needing other treatment options too. And going through kind of the lengthy process of getting FDA approval will actually limit those other options that we can try and do now to find better treatment than map if we can. Um, this is where a lot of treatments are tyrosine kinases because they are more targeted therapy. Um, they're Side effects are not the same thing as like say anti-microtubule or anti-nucleic acid type of treatments. Those kind of treatments are actually chemotherapies. They are definitely the kind of classic chemotherapy that we use for cancer. And chemotherapy for cancer oftentimes have a lot more side effects than the targeted therapies. 
And so that's why um, we don't tend to look at those type of treatments for NF2 or other NF or schwannomatosis. Um, but if, um, I think that the question is, you know, if bevacizumab is not available, um, other than clinical trials, can we use any of these other drugs off-label? And I did see a couple of those questions also. And actually, drugs like lipadnib or everolimus are FDA approved for other diseases. And so they can always be tried off-label. So in, at least in the US, we can always prescribe a drug. Um, obviously, if they're off-label and don't have any clinical trial data that they work for NF2, then an insurance company could deny uh, prescribing those medications, but they could be used as second, third line when trial options are not available and bevacizumab is no longer an option for treatment. So that brings me to a question for the other side of the ocean. Um, there was a question around clinical trials for NF2 in Europe and in the UK. Um, are there, what are the options, let's see, the treatment options on the other side of the ocean? Well, and um, Ross, could you comment? On no, for the moment, we don't have any. We had a trial with Everolimus, but for the moment, we are waiting to to be able to include patient. But there is uh, nothing new. But I think that Avastin changed totally the prognosis of NF2. So we have to to tell that uh, it's still a very good drug, and it's efficient. So it's IV, but I think that it's a very good drug still a good drug. Okay, and then I had one more question on, unless Dr. Ferner, you wanted to comment on this? Um, just to say oh. that um, in the UK, there are four uh, NF2 centers and they're all using bevacizumab. As regards clinical trials linking uh, with the US, there are some difficulties in trying to uh, organize it um, because of uh, problems with having external PI. So I think people are working hard to try to resolve that issue. So and maybe I can I can say a little bit. We are in in Europe. We are now part of a big European effort called EU Pearl, which is a very large collaborative effort that CTF has helped make happen, let's be honest. Um, and we are working on developing platform trials also in Europe. And so that is something that, uh, that is ongoing now and that I hope we will be able to report on very soon. And the major NF centers like Dr. Ferner Center, like Dr. Calamarida Center are part of this, um, of this initiative. So um, I think we are making progress globally now. Um, Tracy Galloway, I know that you raised your hand, so maybe you want to ask your question. And while you get unmuted, there is one question about the frequency for imaging needed for schwannomatosis patients. Um, is there a, let's say, an, um, a golden rule or is there a... So this person says, I have now a scan every six months. Um, is there a standard procedure here? So there's, there's going to be actually a white paper coming out on this. Uh, there's a whole group of people working through the NIH on putting together a white paper for management. Some of that is for management of plexiform neurofibroma, some of it's for management of schwannomatosis and so on. There is no gold standard of exactly how often you do imaging. The most appropriate thing to do is to tailor it to the individual patient. So you tailor it in the sense of where the tumors are, what the growth pattern has, be, has been in the past on the patient, and what your concerns are for further growth of various tumors. That tailors what you're going to do in terms of frequency of imaging. And it's usually somewhere between three to four months for tumors that are growing and are in critical areas, to a year for whole body scanning, in a lot of protocols, to two years. It's very rare that a center that I know of will go more than two years without serial scanning, but most are around a year with serial scanning. But again, it has to be tailored to the individual patient. 
Um, could I just say that um, in the UK, uh, we're going to shock you because um, obviously we uh, image people with symptoms, so we tailor it to the individual. But people who do not have symptoms in schwannomatosis, we have all agreed to image, and that's uh, Manchester as well as us, uh, uh, image uh, every three years. Um, and just because a schwannoma is growing, it doesn't mean to uh, say that it has to be taken out. Um, we very much, as you say, tailor it to the individual, but we do have a surveillance uh, scheme. You're muted, Annette. Sorry. Uh, Tracy? Yes, um, I had a, a quick question. It's come up um, kind of often in our, especially in our pediatric groups. There's some young uh, NF2 patients that tend to have these schwannomas that impact the carotid artery. And I was just wanting to know um, in your experiences, how often are those operated upon and when do you make a decision to do so? So, uh, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting challenge. The head and neck, if we, if we think about it in general in terms of the head and neck distribution of the tumors, the ones that are growing in the neck and the soft tissues of the neck are certainly a challenge. Often they're involving uh, areas around the carotid, often they're involving vagus nerve, which can be a real challenge to deal with. It's actually uncommon that these patients require surgery. And I again agree with Dr. Ferner 100%. Just because a tumor is growing doesn't need it doesn't mean it has to be removed. It's only when it's becoming symptomatic and causing grief, a neurological deficit, that we consider removing the tumor, or it's compromising the tissues next to it in such a manner that that becomes dangerous to the patient. So more often than not, we follow these along, and it's actually uncommon that we end up operating on them, much, much less commonly and more so. Annette, you're muted. Okay, um, thanks. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, what we will do, because of course we're already 2.18 the day before a long weekend, so we don't want to hold people too long, but what we will do is we will um, collect some of the frequently asked questions from the people that are on the webinar here, and we will work with, hopefully with the panelists, to answer these questions and make sure that they will be available on the website. So although we may not be covering the frequently asked questions today, uh, we just wanted to make sure that we will not forget you. But with that, I just would quickly like to introduce our board member. We opened with a patient. We want to close with the father of a patient and a very active board member of the um, CTF board of directors and also one of the co-chairs of the NF2 Accelerator. So RB, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Annette. Uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to say a few words on uh, Global NF2 Awareness Day. I got my shirt on. We're going. Um, I found this program to be very informative and, and frankly inspiring. Uh, Billy's story and the passion of the medical professionals is just, I find, very exciting as a father of an NF2 uh, patient. Um, I and my co chair, uh, John Morris, chair the NF2 Accelerator Committee, and it is our hope to uh, make some progress in this disease. In my particular case, my 16-year-old son was diagnosed with NF2 about six years ago after undergoing about 12 hours of emergency brain surgery to remove a meningioma that was bending his spinal cord into kind of an S-curve. Um, so to me, it's a very personal thing. I'm involved with CTF to hopefully find what I've termed the holy grail, a, a cure for NF2 and all NF. Uh, perhaps that ultimately might be gene therapy or some version of that, but what in the immediate near term is the need for effective new and novel treatments that these skilled clinicians would be able to apply to my son and other affected patients. Um, and CTF is our vehicle to do that. And the funding it's providing to enable the kind of research and coordination with all the, all the you talented folks around the world gives us who are affected by disease or family members who are affected by the disease a lot of hope. 
Um, what, I, what I guess I would ask <clears throat> as an NF2 parent is for everyone to consider how they could help. Could that be volunteering your time, becoming an advocate or an NF2 accelerator, or perhaps making a donation to CTF? Uh, that's easily done at ctf.org backslash donor, donate. It would mean the world to me and my family and all the affected NF patients in the world. I just want to thank you all. Uh, I think the going over when it's such an important topic is, is important. Um, it gives me a lot of hope that we're on the right path here, that we will be able to get this fixed here in the coming years. And I just want to thank everyone for their involvement. Uh, hope you guys have a good weekend and thank you from my perspective. Thank you so much, everybody, for those Americans. Have a very nice Memorial Day weekend. And for the others, European friends, thank you so much for joining us and have a nice weekend. Thank you, thank you, thank you.